Good morning. We'd like to welcome everyone to our services here this morning. Tell you what let's do. Let's stand up and just say hi to the people around you, if you would. Let's stand up right now and just say hi to everybody. <laughs> All right, that's good. <laughs> a friend of mine just accused me of saying that we couldn't socialize anymore, so we'll, we'll find ways to do things, right? <laughs> but appreciate, appreciate everybody being here this morning. We're especially glad if you're visiting with us. Please hang around. We try to fellowship outside because we don't need to inside because of obvious re reasons, COVID-19. But if you could, it's a nice day. Stick around, get to know us. If you need to let the elders know something, uh, don't know who they are, please uh, see one of the members. They'll be glad to point you in the right direction. Certainly, if you're visiting with us by way of live stream, Facebook, or WITB, we're glad to have you and look forward to being with you when you can be back with us. We do have many members that are going through sicknesses now and also surgeries and other things, so we need to be mindful of them as we'll talk about later on in the service. Those leading us in worship this morning, song leader Jared Morgan, opening prayer by Jared Vincent, officiating at the Lord's table will be Jason Jones, scripture reading will be by Derek Tribuco, and a lesson will be brought to us this morning by Mark Ray. If you are visiting with us, you need assistance of the nursery one is provided for you if you exit the auditorium, take a left down the hallway, you'll see the sign of the nursery. It's not attended, but please feel free to take advantage of that if you need it. In order to prepare our minds for worship this morning, I'll be reading from Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. Let's stand together as Jared leads us in our first song this morning. I will learn to walk in your way. 
This next song will have our opening prayer. <clears throat> we praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thy the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thy the glory. Revive us again. Please pray with me. Almighty, great and glorious Father in heaven. Father, uh, as we assemble here this morning, Father, we thank you for allowing each and every one of us to come here to glorify your name and lift your name on high, Father. Father, as we uh, see the changing of the seasons, Father, we see the glory of your power and your creation, Father, and we thank you for that. Father, there are many of those that are sick and afflicted, uh, especially those, Father, of this number, and we ask that you... Put a special blessing upon them, Father, that they may become back, may come back to a better portion of health and be in the service with us once again. Father, we ask you to bless this country, bless this nation, Father, as we go through many different trials, Father. We understand that everything is in your control, and, and we ask that you help the leaders and also help us guide us through this. Father, we thank you for the gift of your son, the life that he lived, and the death that he died for each and every one of us that... One day, Father, we may have that hope of being in heaven with you. Father, bless us throughout the remainder of this service. Let us do everything in a way and in accordance that being according to your word. All this we ask in your son's name. And amen.
In case you haven't noticed it, which I'm sure most of you have, but we live in a very fast-paced, uh, we're very a very results-oriented in a competitive world these days. It's probably always been this way, but it seems like it's just getting more and more uh, as time goes by. Uh, it seems like we're always trying to find new ways and different ways to do things faster and smarter and easier. And we have an end objective of we're trying to get better results and we're trying to find the best way uh, to, do, to do something and to achieve those results. And inherently, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, as a matter of fact, in our lives, uh, a lot of times we have to do that just to exist, whether that's at work or it's at home with your kids and trying to find time to do this and that and the other. Uh, we have to do, we just have to do that. But when we do that in our hurried actions, do we foster some bad habits? Do we tend to take some shortcuts or tend to cut corners on some things that maybe we shouldn't and just to get the results that we want? And obviously to me, the answer is yes. So how does all of that affect partaking the Lord's Supper? Um, do we treat our time during communion the same way? Are we just checking it off the list? Uh, I've been a Christian for over 38 years, and I'm going to answer for me, and I'm going to say that answer is yes. Uh, that has happened, I know, several times. Um, I'm always looking to head to see what's next. Uh, okay, well, what's next on the, on the program here? You know, we're going to pray, we're going to eat a wafer, we're going to pray, we're going to drink the juice, and then Jared's going to lead our next song. So you're just kind of moving down the, the, the checklist there. Can you identify with that? Um, I'm, not tr I'm not trying to, to make anyone feel bad or to judge anyone because, like I said, I'm the, I'm the first one that will admit that. But we have an enormous responsibility in this next part of our worship. 1 Corinthians 11.27 says, Whosoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So let that sink in for just a second. Jesus died for all of our sins. He died for each one of us. But if we don't participate in communion with the right attitude and the right heart, all of that is for nothing. So as we partake, let's all remember the love and the sacrifice that was made for each one of us, and let's return that love here in just the next few moments. So if you will, please pray with me. Dear Father, we come to you now, and we come to you uh, in faith and in love, knowing that, that you are our Father and that you sent your Son for the remission of our sins so that we can one day live in heaven with you. And Father, we know that as we partake of this bread, which represents his body, we, we ask that you be with us and help us to have the right thoughts in our mind and the right attitude in our heart as we do this. We ask this through your son's name. Amen. Let's pray again for the fruit of the vine. Again, Father, we come to you just in awe of the love that you have shared for each one of us. And we know that Jesus came to this earth and he lived, but more importantly, he died for us. And in that death, he shed his blood 
which represents the remission of our sins. And Father, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, help us to do so, to remember all of the love shown to us and for us, Father, and, and help us to show that love back to you. And again, it's through your son's name we pray. Amen. And so at this time, we have com completed the communion portion of the worship, and we do have uh, the opportunity now with the boxes in the back to, to give back for the work. So at this time, let us pray over those monies. Father, we thank you so much for the not only the spiritual blessings, but the physical blessings that you have given to each one of us. We know that we are extremely blessed, and we ask that as we give back, to you, we know all everything that we have comes from you, and help us to do so with the right manner in our heart, and help us to use these monies and these funds to do the work that would bring the most souls to you, and help us to spread your word, not only in our local communities, but also across our country and across the world. Just please be with those efforts and bless them, and again, it's through your son's name we pray, amen. Yeah. 
Our scripture reading before the lesson comes from Luke chapter 19, verse 40. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Please be seated. Good morning. We are. It's good to see everybody here today. Glad that you're here to be with us. Glad that we have this opportunity to study God's Word together. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles, Luke chapter 19 and verse 40. That's where our lesson will be from. Luke chapter 19 and verse 40. As we get started, um, Wednesday night, our speaker is going to be Malcolm May. Malcolm's one of my close friends that I knew when I was in Jackson. And I'm excited about introducing him to you. Uh, one of the funny things that it's always been between Malcolm and I is um, we look just alike. Uh, he's like a doppelganger of mine, but still come anyway, you know. But um, he's about, I'd say, 10 years older than me. But uh, his hair is, uh, let's not say receding, just running. And um, it, it's, it's kind of interesting because people have always thought we're brothers. And so that's kind of the running joke. He's May, I'm Ray. So that's how you tell the difference between us. But Come Wednesday night, I think you'll like Malcolm. He'll be a pretty good guy to know. And so that'll be a good thing for us to do. Now, as we start the lesson today, what I have are three stones. And there's really nothing significant about these stones. So you would uh, pass by them and not even notice a thing going on with them. They, as a matter of fact, they came out of my driveway. So probably the location of your future pothole, which will be there. But... I want us to use these stones, to think about these stones, for our lesson that we're running across of today. Now, you read Luke 19.40, and as a preacher, you look at it and you think, what in the world do I preach about on this verse? And preachers go a lot of different directions. You know, we're like Acts 8.4, preachers go everywhere preaching the Word. Uh, sometimes you get strange subjects. And so, a lot of people will look at Luke 19.40, and they'll say, ah... We're going to talk about stones. We're going to talk about apologetics or proving that Christianity is correct. And so we look at it and we say the stones cry out. We run to uh, was it Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. The invisible attributes of God are seen by the visible parts of this world. That as you and I look at the oceans and the desert, as you and I look at the stones, as you and I look at genetics and all these things, God cries out to us. And so while people sometimes, as part of God's creation, don't speak the way they should, they don't glorify God the way they should, creation certainly does. And so many times that's the way we go in that lesson. Sometimes we look at it and we uh, want to use context. What is it Jesus is talking about in this specific passage? What is it that's going on here? Well, you start reading the verses afterwards, and he says the stones are going to cry out. And then he begins talking about the destruction of Jerusalem because they've turned away from God. And he looked four verses later, and he says, let me tell you, within this generation, A.D. 70, within this generation, not one stone will be left upon another, but the entire city shall be flattened. And as you look at that, and you begin reading in Matthew 24, and look at the first four verses of Matthew 24, very likely, contextually, what Jesus is saying is similar to what we read in our Bibles from Philippians 2, 9 through 11. That if you don't cry out for the Lord now, you will someday. You see, every knee shall bow, those in heaven, those under the earth, those under the earth, and every tongue shall glorify God the Father. You either worship Him now or in the judgment you shall worship him and acknowledge his place. And so contextually, that's where this verse is leading. That's what we're looking at as we look there. But I want us today to look at this passage in an allegorical sense. To think about the word stones, to think about the word stone, and see how it's used, specifically in the New Testament, but also a little bit in the Old Testament as well. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at these three stones and see what it is that each one represents. And as you and I read about stones in the Bible, see what it is that God is trying to tell us. That He's trying to tell us through His Son as He speaks of these stones that are crying out. And so as we look at this first stone, we see Peter in the Gospel. So go ahead and turn to your Bible. You know where we're headed, don't you? Matthew chapter 16. 
And as you begin reading through Matthew chapter 16, you see where Jesus is standing before his apostles and he asks a question. Now you'll notice John chapter 1 verse 42, Andrew brings his brother to Jesus and that brother is Cephas or Simon. And as Simon appears before Jesus, Jesus looks at him and says, you will be called rock. You will be called Peter. Well, you know, that's interesting, I guess you would say. (laughs) Simon would say, all right, that's interesting, Jesus. But then we get to Matthew chapter 16. And in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus says, who do you say that I am? The apostles respond. They say, some say Jeremiah, Elijah, John the Baptist. Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? And so you begin reading there in verse 16, and Peter says something. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Very significant passage as we look at that. The Christ means anointed, means Messiah, means a chosen king. And what Peter is telling Jesus is you are the chosen one of God. You are the son of David and the king of all Israel. The other part of that is son of the living God. Jesus, you are deity. And so there we see the great confession. The statement that every one of us have said when we obeyed the gospel. Going all the way back through 20 centuries. Now, if you've studied this passage or heard sermons about this passage or read books about this passage by a Protestant or even by a member of the Lord's Church, there's a lot of ink spilled about Petra, Petros, different tenses of, of what rock is in that passage. And that's because some religious groups teach that Peter, when he made this statement, became the head of the church. And so Jerusalem, Antioch, Constantinople, Rome, all these churches would, even Babylon, would claim Peter because they thought it made them more important than every other church. But we read in Galatians 2 that while Peter was considered to be one of the pillars of the church, Peter likewise was a sinner. We see in Galatians 2, he struggled with racism, Jews and Gentiles. He struggled sometimes with hypocrisy. He struggled sometimes with the things he would say. And so this word Peter is not referring necessarily to the man himself. It's referring to what he said or what he did. Uh, For an example, looking back in the book of Genesis, you see Sarai. Sarai received a message from God with her husband. Now, We're not going to go around and tell the ages of all the women who are here. But none of you, as far as I can tell, and I'm even wearing my glasses today, are 90 years old. But imagine if you're half that age, 45, 50, 55. Imagine if you found out today that you're pregnant. Oh, my goodness. What do we do now, right? Oh, (laughs) <laughs> what do you do? If you're 90 years old, what do you do? Imagine a 90-year-old chasing the toddler. Imagine a 90-year-old going through all the things that you go through in pregnancy. Oh, my goodness. Sarah heard this and laughed. And God said, that's right. As a matter of fact, your name's going to be laughter, Sarah. And that's what Sarah means, one who laughs. Well, that didn't define Sarah. But that name was given because of what Sarah did, because of what Sarah said. In the same way, that's what we're talking about when we talk about Peter. When you're talking about Peter, he is the founder of the church in that way. Not that he died for our sins. Not that he supersedes Christ or even stands in Christ's stead and following after him. But it's a statement that Peter said that shows that Jesus is a Christ, that the church is founded upon. In John 6, 66, Jesus had all of his disciples leave him. He looked to his apostles and he said, are you going to leave too? Peter says in John 6, 68, Lord, to whom else shall we go? For you have the words of life. And so we see on that wonderful day in Acts chapter 2, that wonderful day, that Peter stood up, filled by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was upon him and all the apostles, and they all spoke, but we have a record of what Peter said. And Peter told them, once again, the good confession. He preached for the very first time the gospel. This one whom God has given us was put to death, was buried, and was raised. 
And he said, that's not David speaking of himself because David's tomb was still there, even in their sight. But it's Jesus. And he said, this man you have taken with lawless hands and you have crucified him. And yet God has raised him up. And so the people cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And so what did Peter say? Repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, for your children, and for all those who are far off, as many as our Lord God would call. And Peter continues saying, save yourself from this corrupt generation. So the stone is there. And as you and I read about that stone, you and I read about the gospel, we see that the Lord adds to the church daily those who are being saved. And we see that stone or the gospel existing. As you and I read in our Bibles, we see Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Romans 5.1, for we are justified by faith. Romans 5.8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 16.16, 16, the church is a Christ. They salute you. And so we run through that passage and we see that stone, that foundation that started the church came through Peter. But more importantly, or more correctly, we could say the gospel and the gospel cries out. Luke 19, 40, about the glory, the deity and the power of Jesus. And then we come to our other stone. And as we look at our other stone, we turn in our Bibles over to 1 Peter chapter 2. And so if you have your Bible with you, go ahead and turn to that passage. Um, if you're on your electronic device, pause Facebook for a second, and go to 1 Peter chapter 2 and let's check it out. Because as you and I read about 1 Peter chapter 2, we begin reading about the glorious, wonderful nature of Jesus Christ. Read there in verse 4. Coming to him as a living stone. Now, stones aren't alive. You can talk to a stone. You remember back when people had pet rocks? Used to love having a pet rock. It's the only pet I ever had that didn't run away when I was a kid. Lost it all the time, though. Rocks are not alive. They don't have feelings. But you see, Christ is a living stone. He was put to death. He was placed in a grave. He was a body. But he was resurrected for you and I. And as you and I think about that idea of a living stone, we see something which is counterintuitive to what we usually assume. A person in the grave is gone. They've gone to their maker. But Jesus is a living stone. He's alive. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18. Jesus was dead, yet he is now alive. He lives forevermore. And he says, I have the keys to Hades and death. In Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25, we see that Jesus, as a living stone, is able to save to the uttermost because he lives today and speaks intercession for those of us who stand before God. And so this living stone, this stone which cares for you, which thinks about you, which knows you, which protects you, is Jesus Christ. But then we go to the next verse, verse 5. The foundation. You see, the foundation of the church is not Peter. It's not any man. It's not a creed. It's not a denomination. The foundation is Christ. And so as we look at that, we see that Christ, Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 19, is the cornerstone of our faith. And we'll get to that here in a little bit. But you see, we have been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And Jesus is that cornerstone For each and every one of us. Now, why is that important? Remember back in your VBS days, we used to sing a song. You remember it? The wise man, he built his house on a rock. Favorite part of that song is when you get to clap in church because the foolish man's house went bang, right? As Jesus talks about that, notice what he's talking about. Not just the VBS song, but the lesson. You see, those who are foolish, he says are those who will build their house on sands which shift and sands which move. And Jesus says those who build their house in a place like that, things change and that house will collapse. 
How many of us have built our foundation upon our identity and our job? How many of us build our foundation upon our health, the fact that we can handle anything that we face? How many of us build our foundation upon money or possessions or reputation or whatever else it may be? That house will collapse. And Jesus says that foundation which fails is that that those who hear the words of the Bible refuse to do it. But Jesus says those who hear my word and do do it as well, they have built their house upon the rock. And those winds may come, those waters may rise, life may get you in one way or the other, but the house will always stand firm. That's why you build that house. That's why that foundation must be on the rock. But then you look in verse 6. In verse 6, we see that Christ is the cornerstone. Now, that doesn't really come across in our culture and time. Uh, Perhaps you've seen some church buildings. You go over to the church on Olive Street Uh, You'll see that little concrete thing at the bottom. It says, you know, the Church of Christ founded either 1922 or AD 33. Uh, Many times when we put that on a church building, it's more decorative. What they talk about in the Bible when they talk about a cornerstone is the pattern. You find the most perfect stone you can find, which is cut in just the right way, which is the right measurements, the right strength, the right density. Of all the choices, you find the best one, and you put it in that first corner. And that will set everything in this wall straight and set everything on that wall straight as well. And if you've got two walls, it's a little bit easier to make the house plumb, to make the house square. Jesus is our cornerstone. He is, as we would say in the Bible, our pattern. 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23, he has left us an example that we should walk in his steps. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning of verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, lay aside all those things which ensnare us, the sin which brings us down, and let's run with the race, run with endurance the race is set before us. For Jesus is there cheering us on. But then look at verse 6. Verse 6 Not just a foundation, not just a cornerstone. A special word there, especially for Peter. Precious. He is that precious stone. Notice for a few minutes how Peter treats this word precious. We see in the Old Testament, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of one of his saints. Notice how Peter likes this word precious. 2 Peter 1.1, we have a like and a precious faith. What we believe is precious in the sight of God. 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4, we see His exceedingly great and precious promises, giving us everything that pertains to life and to godliness. And as you look at that precious faith, as you look at those precious promises, they all come down to the precious Precious stone. For we are not bought with corruptible things like gold and silver, but with the incorruptible, precious blood of Jesus Christ. You see, God gave the most important thing that He had so that you could be saved. God gave the most precious thing in His life so that you could be with Him forever. That's how much God loves you. And that's how important you are to God. But hanging out there in 1 Peter 2 still, preachers could say hanging out, can't they? Look there in verse 8. goes a different direction. Not only a cornerstone, not only a foundation stone, not only a precious stone, but a stumbling stone. Stumbling stone. You're probably different than me. But every once in a while, there's something I ought to see, and I don't see it. I've got a trailer hitch on the back of my truck. It sticks out about that far. Guess what I do way too often? I'm too busy looking here or there, and I walk around, and I hit my shin on that thing. I'm a preacher, so I don't cuss. But, man, it hurts. It hurts. 
oh, it hurt so bad. I don't know. I think preachers cuss. I try not to cuss because I'm a Christian. But, oh, it hurts so bad. And I should know it's there, and I forget it's there, and then I'll walk right into it, and it hurts. You know what? Whether I believe that hitch is there or I don't believe that hitch is there, that hitch is there when I hit it. Whether it should be there or whether it shouldn't be there, in my opinion, that hitch is there when I hit it. There's a lot of people in this world that tell you Jesus is nothing more than a myth. And they'll do everything they can to convince you that Christianity, there's nothing to it. Jesus is that stone. He is there. And whether you will admit to it or not, you will be judged by Jesus. A lot of people may say, well, okay, there's Jesus, but I'm going to believe in a different kind of Jesus, one without judgment, one without holiness, one without power, and I'm going to live any way I want. And a lot of people have created their own religion, and a lot of people have created their own philosophy. That stone is still there, and it can be a stumbling block to those who reject Christ. In John chapter 1, verses 19, or excuse me, through verses 9 through 12, talks about that true light that came into this world, but his own did not beheld, behold him. They wanted the darkness and they went back into the darkness. But John tells us that light's going to appear to all people. We see in 1 Corinthians 1, beginning of verse 18, that the foolishness of God is greater than all the wisdom of God. Of men. And the weakness of God can outpower even the strongest of all people. And so, as this stone stands before us today, the stone of Jesus Christ, we see that it must be acknowledged or we will stumble. But we see that it's our foundation. We see that it's a cornerstone. We see that it's precious. We see that it's living. That regular stone God has made to be wonderful. But that brings us to our third stone. And as we look at this third stone, we spend some time over in the New Testament. You know, stones have their own little story. And I'm not a geologist of any sort, but this is a sedimentary stone. It was created at some time, probably in the last few decades, in a riverbed, most likely. It was shaped a certain way, made to move a certain way. After a few years, the guy who owned some land wanted to make some money. He, you don't harvest rocks. What do you do? You quarry rocks. And so that rock was quarried. That rock was brought to a, to a place and finally thrown in the back of a truck and finally dumped in my driveway. I picked it up and I have used it in a sermon today. The rock's probably thinking, what in the world, you know? Um, after this sermon, like I do with all my illustrations, I'll stick it in the pulpit. It'll probably be here about the next five years till somebody cleans out this pulpit to be thrown into the parking lot or wherever else. Stones have an interesting history. And Daniel, in Daniel 2, talks about an interesting history of a church. Of a stone. You see, a man who lived hundreds of miles away from Jerusalem had a dream. And you know the dream, Nebuchadnezzar, head of gold, chest of silver, belly of bronze, legs of iron. And you go through and you see all these great and mighty kingdoms that have come through in mankind's history. Every one of them started and every one of them ended. But you begin reading there in verse 44... And you see, in the days of these kings, that's Rome, there shall be a stone, verse 45, not made with hands. And that stone shall grow and fill the earth and shall smash, destroy all these great kingdoms. And this stone shall remain forever. Now, you and I would look at this rock today, and it does not seem very significant. It's small. Not very heavy. And if we threw it into a field, you would probably have difficulty figuring out which rock was which. Many people today think of the church as insignificant. 
It appears small. It appears sometimes weaker than we want it to. But this stone, which the builders rejected, Psalm 118, verse 22, is now the cornerstone, the chief stone of the world. Before you're an American, you're a member of the Lord's church. Before you're a Democrat, before you're a Republican, you're a member of the Lord's church. Before you're a husband or a wife, before you're wealthy or poor, before you're whatever color in the world you may be, you're a member of the Lord's church. We're a part of a wonderful, beautiful kingdom. A kingdom that shall remain forever. People are going to vote in certain ways. People are going to push things certain ways. But the kingdom shall always remain. And the kingdom shall always stand. And so as you and I think about that, we see very strongly here the power of of these three stones. And as we put these three stones together and look at these three stones, we see God's plan. We see that statement from Peter. Perhaps it looks unpopular. Perhaps to us today it seems simplistic. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But Jesus says that's the foundation. That's what every single person who follows God must say. We must follow that gospel which Peter preached. We see just a few years later in Acts 2 where the church is founded. And as you and I look at that founding of the church, we see the focus is upon Christ. The stumbling stone to this world is now the precious cornerstone foundation that every one of us can rely upon. God does not lie. Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. And that's why you must hold to him and build upon that solid rock. Those who follow Jesus, those who have said the good confession, those who have followed his example in baptism, are added to the Lord's church. Insignificant in the eyes of some people, but precious in the sight of God. And as you and I remain faithful to God, as you and I follow after Him, we can become fellow citizens. We can become brethren in the sight of God. And whatever this world holds against us, we shall overcome. Because of God is with us. Who can be against us? This morning, if the invitation applies to you, if you need to make the good confession, if you need to obey the gospel or the pattern of Christ, if you need the prayers of the church, we invite you to come forward as as we sing. Have you been to Jesus Jesus for the clear?
Thank you, Mark, for reminding us of, about our rock of salvation and the good confession that Peter made and help us to always remember that Jesus Christ is our rock and the only way to God the Father and the only way to salvation. Thank you. I have a few announcements this morning. We want to express our sympathy to the family of Charles Starks, who passed away and the funeral was held on Friday. He was the husband of Donna Starks and the father of Alicia Smith. Need to remember that family this week. As far as prayers and cards of encouragement, the following people we need to remember. Nathan Pertle has been rescheduled to have his port removed Monday, October the 5th, and the pre-op and COVID test will be Friday, October the 2nd. Kenna Jones got some good news from her surgeon. He's indicated that the aneurysm that she has is low risk for now, and they'll be monitoring that, and if it grows or if he thinks it's time to, uh, to proceed with surgery, they will do that. But at this time, it's good news. It's considered low risk. Bill Morgan, as you know, he'll have knee surgery, and that will be tomorrow at Murray Calloway County. Let's remember Bill. I'm sure he'll take some time to recuperate, so let's remember Bill. Christy Ford was taken by ambulance to Baptist Health Thursday evening. She's home and improving. I think she's with us this morning. Yes, yeah, she's with us this morning. So good to have you back. Glad to have you with us this morning. Lonnie Lynch, a brother of Selena Jones, fell and broke his arm, his arm, shoulder, and hip on the 23rd. So quite painful, I'm sure. So let's remember him. Chris and Kelly Smithmeyer, the neighbors of the Westerfields, Let's remember them and also remember all those on the rest of our prayer list and the addresses of the above that I mentioned are in the daily updates. And as I'll speak to a little bit later, we need to remember Rhonda Ray. Will you, will you go with me to our Father in Heaven at this time as we pray? Dear God, we thank you for this time that we can assemble and worship you and we pray that our worship has been reverent, has been acceptable to you this morning. We pray that your name has been honored and glorified, and we pray that we have been edified and enriched by being here this morning. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to be with Nathan Pirtle as he goes and has his port removed on Monday, October the 5th, and we pray that everything will go well with him. We're thankful for the good news that Kenna Jones received, and we pray that that will continue to be a good situation, that we, you will give her strength and comfort during this time. We pray for Bill Morgan as he faces knee surgery tomorrow, that you will give him the strength to get through it, and the rehabilitation will, will go well for him. And we thank you that Christy Ford could be back with us and all is well with her. We pray that you will be with Lonnie Lynch, Selena Jones's brother, as he recovers from his fall with a broken arm, shoulder, and hip. Please give him the strength, and we pray that he will turn to you for guidance. Please be with Selena as she takes care of him. We pray that you will continue to be with Chris and Kelly Smithmeyer during their difficult time, and we thank you for Jody and Corey and the good influence that they've been. We pray, Father, that you will you will be with Rhonda Ray as she faces some difficulties, and you also be with Mark at this time. Pray that everything will go well. Help us, Lord, to continue to be the people you want us to be, to be the good influence, the good examples in the community, to always be willing to help each other, it's just to try and study and pray every day, and, and to be more like Christ every day. And forgive us when we when we have fallen, please forgive us of our sins. These things we ask in Christ's name, and amen. Other announcements this morning. As you know, we've set up a system to where you can have your contribution withdrawn automatically from your checking accounts, and those forms are available in, in the foyer of the credenzas, and that, uh, that program is underway. It has started, so we have a few that have signed up for that. So please feel free to sign up for that and turn your forms back into the office. And if you have questions about it, you could see me, you could see one of the elders, Brent Lentz, or me especially, and, uh, and Beth Farley. I'd be glad to answer any questions about that. As far as the youth group is concerned, anyone missing the parent meeting that we had the other night, 
can pick up the youth group handbook and medical release from the, it's the form, the medical, medical release form. It's on the youth table in the foyer. So pick that up if you need that. Guys and girls devotional will be tonight between seven and eight o'clock. Uh, Nathan cannot be there. Darcy, I think, has been a little bit sick and under the weather. He's going to be home with her. But Scott Phillips will be leading the group tonight. As you know, our Sunday evening service, we do not have an assembly, but the lesson from Mark will start at 6 p.m., and you can see that live stream, Facebook, or listen to it on WITB Radio. And our Wednesday night service uh, will begin 6.30 with our summer series speaker, as Mark mentioned, be uh, Malcolm May from Jackson, Mississippi. We look forward and hope everyone can be with us. That will be our last service with the summer series format. So we wanted to announce starting today that when we resume our classes on, it will be October the 7th, Wednesday, October the 7th, we'll have classes available as we do now for kindergarten through high school and an adult class. And what we plan to do is the adults will come into the auditorium and the children and K through, K through 12 will go to their classes. There will not be a standard devotional. You'll just come to the classes beginning at 6.30 p.m. and then we will dismiss at 7.15. So we'll have 45 minutes of classes. Just come straight to the class and they will, we will dismiss from our classes. Hopefully that was clear. But it will be announced also Wednesday and in the bulletin and then again next Sunday. We do have this card that I'd like to read from Kenna Jones. It says, A day is made more beautiful when touched with kindness. Thank you for your special thoughtfulness. Brothers and sisters, thank you so much for your prayers, cards, and calls during my recent illness. It is such a blessing to me that your love was shared so abundantly. Dan and I truly cherish the Christian friendships we have made since moving here. Love, Kenna. The New Pathways for Children, and we've been involved with that for several years, does a really good work over in Graves County. It's been a little bit difficult for them this week because, or this year because of COVID-19, but they are kind of having a special, they're having a special day and trying to raise up to $100,000. And we've kind of decided to just announce this as you can for the next couple of weeks or even the next month, but as soon as possible, if you'd like to make a donation to this, they rely entirely on donations. And it's amazing what they've been able to do. They do a really good work. But the theme of the campaign this year, New Pathways for Children, No More Fatherless Campaign, Special Offering. That's what it is, trying to raise $100,000. So if you want to contribute to that, please see any of the elders, and uh, we'll make sure that your money goes to that good cause. The final announcement that I have this morning if there are no others at this time. I would just like simply to read, this is from Rhonda Ray. It says, Dear church family, this is a hard letter for me to write, and this may be hard for you to hear. I wanted you to know that I, Rhonda Ray, have been recently diagnosed with ovarian cancer. I'm seeking treatment in Nashville, Tennessee, and I've already had many tests and procedures over the past few weeks and we'll be starting chemotherapy Monday, and that's tomorrow. I'm devastated by this news after being married only two years. Mark is a wonderful man, and his happiness means the world to me. I'm also devastated by the news for the sake of my children. It has only been four years ago that they lost their father to cancer. I ask that you remember my family in your prayers. They need strength, and they need your love. It is the hardest thing in the world to care for a cancer patient. Thank you, Rhonda. Would you pray with me at this time? Dear God, we come to you now and we want to think about the Ray family, especially Rhonda at this time, as she is facing a difficult time. We pray, Lord, that you will be with all of the doctors and nurses down in Nashville who will be treating Rhonda. We pray that they will give her the very, very best treatment. 
and that all things will be made available to her, whatever they are, recent treatments, recent breakthroughs. We pray that they will be able to treat this cancer, and we would ask that you would heal her. We would pray also, Father, for Mark, as it's going to be a difficult time for him and for the children. We pray that they will lean on you, that they will help her in every way, that they will stay positive through this, that Rhonda will stay positive through it, and all of us will stay positive, and help us to reach out to that family in every way that we can, to give them the comfort and the strength, to help give them the comfort and strength that they're going to need. And we pray that you will give them that comfort and strength and peace that passes all understanding. We're so thankful for Rhonda and Mark and their marriage, what she means to Mark, what Mark means to her. And please help us to reach out in every way that we can. These things we ask in Christ's name and amen. At this time, I think, Jerry, you have a, a song, Dismissal, and if you would, let's, uh, from the balcony, let's dismiss first from the balcony. As Jared sings, our dismissal song will be making our way out to the, to the parking lot. Thank you for being here this morning.